Hey, welcome back to topic two, part five of, uh, and topic two is about functions and equations, and look at what part five is about. Are you happy or not? This is quadratic functions, and we're not going to do much more than review what's been done in previous years. So that's good news. I think you would have seen all this before, quadratic functions, and of course a graph of a quadratic function is a parabola. And we're going to look at where these names come from in a minute. But do you remember, this is a convex parabola, or opens upwards, opens upwards is another way of saying it. Do you remember, this happens if that little coefficient in there is a positive, greater than naught. And if that little thing in there, that coefficient of x squared, that a value is negative, it becomes a concave parabola or opens downwards is um, a probably a less formal way of saying it, opens downwards. How do you remember concave? I'll put you in a cave here, mate. There you are. We'll sit you in a little cave. There's a cave over the top. So that gives you uh, a little quick way of remembering whether it's convex or concave. So that's good stuff. What about up here? You can see we're delving into what we just did. If you translate y equals x squared, neg 3 in the x direction, and that's what we've done here, it becomes plus 3 in the x term. The x squared term becomes x plus 3. And then we translate it up by 2. So uh, there, the transformation stuff is good for us here to see how to move around a parabola and uh, what its formula would become. Let's come down and look at some of that terminology now and uh, just see what Pearson's got to say. The word quadratic comes from quadratus in uh, Latin, which means four-sided or a square. So uh, numerous, numerous quadratus means a square number. Now, because in this function, and just have a look up here, because in this function we're going to have a highest power of the variable is the square, we have actually picked that part, meaning a square number, and called it a quadratic. Even though quad often uh, means quadruple or four, or well, if you have a quad in a rowing uh, situation, you'll have three other people in the boat, there'll be four in a boat. But we're taking quadratic to refer to the square aspect of quadratus. And so that's the highest power of the variable that we've got in these functions. So let's have a look. Uh, Pearson's here talks about polynomials and uh, these uh, screen clippings again are from Pearson's textbook so it would be good to have a copy of that or the e-version handy by because a polynomial function means many powers of the variable poly many powers of the variable we have looked at a linear function the power of the variable there is just one and then of course we're going to quadratics to square quadratus sort of thing I don't need m there I think we just have uh, AX squared plus BX plus C is what you remember. So the highest power there is 2. So this is called degree or the highest power of the variable degree 1 polynomial. This is a degree 2. And of course we could keep going and construct polynomials of higher and higher degree. They don't have to have all the terms underneath here. But we call it a polynomial many powers. This would be degree 3, that's called a cubic, and we know what this one is, it's a quadratic. So we have systematic naming here, and of course it keeps going. You could have fourth power, etc. Et and so this would be degree, meaning the highest power, degree 4, and that's called a quartic. For four, of course. Okay, so there's uh, a whole family. At the moment, we're only going to stop here at the first two, a straight line and uh, a uh, quadratic, uh, ax squared plus bx plus c. Let's go down and have a look at some basics now. And there's a definition from Pearson's of a quadratic function. Um, here we go, we've just done that and the graph is called a parabola. Well, I wonder if you know why it's called a parabola. Well, the concave one is the best indicator. If I say, if you throw an object 
it's going to follow a pattern like this when you throw it only gravity is the force acting now downwards and so it's parabolic do you realize that parabola um, is equivalent to throne I think in Greek means the word throne or is equivalent to the word throne so they realized that this shape was what you got when you threw an object okay so that's where the shape parabola for a quadratic function comes from all right so uh, we know that uh, here if uh, and we've done this up above we've done a quick summary of this if a is greater than naught that's a little number in front of x squared it's convex or opens upwards if uh, that number in front of x squared is less than naught or negative it's concave opens downwards so that's a little bit of a review and of course it's got symmetry and so the axis of symmetry is right in the middle and that goes through the vertex so just a revision of some of those ideas we're going to unpack those a lot in this presentation so let's come down now and have a look so each parabola is symmetric about a line called its axis of symmetry so that's good so here is a axis of symmetry the axis of symmetry of the original do there is the y-axis okay or the line x equals naught for that original function and then as we move it around or translate it so we're going to change that vertex and the axis of symmetry will move so this axis of symmetry in this green one here is x equals neg 3 we have moved it by adding 3 to the x term so that represents a neg 3 shift in the x direction okay so the vertex is the peak or it's going to be the minimum value in the case of a convex or the maximum value in the case of a concave and so um, the, uh, the points there are going to be important all right so let's keep going and have a look and you know uh, in previous study you have had several forms for the function our I suppose standard form is this one ax squared plus bx plus c but there are two other forms that are very very valuable and of course this one is usually called the vertex form and so if you can get it in that form you can easily identify the translation if it's neg h in terms of the x term it's a plus h move in the x direction and a plus k move because of this in the y so let's do it over here plus 3 will move the vertex across neg 3 opposite direction and up plus 2 okay so just remember if you change the x term the actual x move is opposite to that sign and then it's the same sign as the y so that's the vertex form usually referred to here uh, and of course you can expand it and get the general form what i refer to the general form there ax squared plus bx plus c so uh, this is a very powerful form uh, this one up here where you put it as a outside of x take h squared plus k because you can see quite clearly how the vertex of naught naught originally come over here on this graph the vertex of y equals x squared is usually naught naught and then you will move it according to these numbers here in x take h squared plus k all right bit of revision let's come down and have a look so this is sometimes called the standard form not usually but sometimes and when you if you can write it in this form it's a powerful form where a is not naught so if a was naught that wouldn't that would just be a simple function y equals k so that wouldn't be a quadratic and it wouldn't have an axis of symmetry at h and a vertex at hk so this is all to do with when you look at this function you can see it's been moved h in the x opposite sign to this one here and k in the y so now and still so that means its steepness was originally that the a out the front so it was one of this family like this with varying steepnesses but this was naught naught 
and so it's been moved H in the X. If H was positive, be over there, and K in the Y, and that will be your new vertex. Your new axis would be X equals H. So that's what they're saying, picking up on the transformation work that we just did. So have a look at that. You might pause it and just study what's written there, maybe make your own notes. Okay, so there is value, isn't there? Do you agree? There's value in Bauer to get from the general form into this form. Because one of the things it gives you straight away is the vertex. Okay, so this is called completing the square, making a square up. Let's do the revision. And the way Pearson's describe it here is good. So it says that if you want to make a square expression, there's a certain pattern between terms, and that is the number in front of x, if it's going to be a perfect square, half that and square and add it on will make a perfect square, this square. So check that. When you expand that, you get this. But it gives you a good idea of what you need to do. So here, if you start off, let's start off with a function just x squared plus px, what do you have to put on the end to make this a perfect square? What this is saying is you need to get the number in front of x, divide it by 2, and square it and add it on. So let's put those steps down here. Half the coefficient of x, then we square it, and add it on. That completes the square. But to keep the line the same, we will then have to subtract that value. So that's the idea, because what we're saying here is when you have this pattern up here, it always factors to that perfect square. The middle term is twice the product. Okay, now we usually do this with only a one always have one in front there. Okay, and they've got that stated down here. So we're going to have a look at some examples of that. Let's go down and see if we can do it. So here's the first example. So here's our function, and we want to get it in this form so you can find out the vertex and where it's positioned. It's, it's translation, if you like. So let's first of all here, uh, start with our function, x squared take 8x plus 18. What are we going to do? There we are, we get to that point, we halve the number in front of x, which is neg 4, square it and add it on. So that now must come to a perfect square. Now we also take it off to keep the meaning of the line the same. And then we have still got the 18 there. Okay, so let's have a look now. This thing here is always a perfect square. When we halve the coefficient, square it and add it on, it's always a perfect square. If we take it off, then this will keep the meaning of that line still the same. So overall, what have we got? We've got a plus two on the end. So this thing, when expanded, will give our original function. And we know that when we construct that first bit by halving the number in front of x, squaring it and it on, it always comes to a perfect square. All right, and what's the advantage of this final line? We can say, hey, the axis of symmetry is 4, being moved across, and the vertex is 4, 2. We get this beautiful looking graph for very little work don't need a calculator, and that's going to be important because in paper one we're not going to have a calculator. All right, do you want to do another one? Let's have a look at another one. And as Pearson said before, we really do need to have not a neg two there. We need to take that out as a factor, divide everything by neg two. What do you multiply neg two by to get neg two x squared? You need x squared. What do you multiply neg two by to get neg twelve x? you need a plus 6. What do you multiply neg 2 by to get neg 7 over 2? It's a plus 7. So you need to actually take that out as a factor before we do our stuff. So in here now, half the number in front of x, so half of 6 is 3, square it and add it on. 
that's always going to give you a perfect square. Then you have to take it off and leave the number that was already there. So this effectively leaves that first line unchanged. So now we've got x plus 3 squared, and this is neg 9 takes 7 over 2, getting them all over 2s. Neg 9 is neg 18 over 2, takes 7 over 2, meaning a total of neg 25 over 2. And it's all within the bracket with a 2 out the front, so let's multiply it out now. Neg 2 times the first term, and then neg 2 times the second is plus 25. So here we have our final function. You can write it like this if you wish. I think um, what we would tend to do here is to um, have a look from here because here we can say there's a neg 3 translation, so the vertex is neg 3 and then 25. Don't actually need to put x take neg 3 squared. If you remember your transformation work, the trans translation is the opposite sign to the change in the x term, if you like. All right, let's go down and graph it now from that form. Very powerful tool. This was not easy for us to graph, but now we've changed it to this form. It's neg 3, 25. Why is it upside down? Come over here, look over here. That was neg 2. So it's a fairly steep concave parabola. Okay, so uh, what are the translations? Well, here's our discussion of how we drew the graph. You, you can see here it's been um, in the order of which it's been done. Um, it's been translated neg 3 to the x and then it's been a vertical stretch of 2 there um, and then a vertical translation up okay, of the graph of y equals neg x squared neg x squared um, ok so now what do they say the graph you've been playing following the transformations on the graph of y equals x squared horizontal translation Reflection in the x-axis, yes, I didn't put that one in. That's the negative. I was thinking of it as coming from the graph neg x squared. Thinking of it as the parent being this one here. So if you want to connect it to the graph of x squared, of course, you need to also reflect it in the axis if you're connecting it to this one. Y equals x squared. You've got to flip it first. Okay. All right. So it's uh, opening down or concave because it's got a negative leading coefficient. This leading term here has got a negative number in front. All right, so is that new? I hope not. Check it out. Let's have a look at the example so, um, of how you could do it for a general quadratic function because this is very powerful. So if you had it in general, so you don't have to do it for every one, is there a pattern? So take out A, what do you multiply A by to get AX squared? It's X squared. What do you multiply A by to get BX? It would be B on AX. What do you multiply A by to get C? It would be C on A. Let's go through the process. Here's the coefficient of X, halve it, square it, add it on. That's now going to give us this square. Then you take off the same thing and you have the number there. This is a bit messy, this here. Uh, we can actually get it over um, a common denominator, but generally we'd leave it like this. So what have we proven? Hey, from this line, the vertex is neg b over 2a for the x value. That's the axis of symmetry. And the y value is c take b squared on 4a. What does that mean? What that means is that here you've got a general result. If you want to find the vertex of this, hey, because we have proven it without specific numbers, that's a deductive reasoning here, deductive reasoning. We haven't used a particular function in there. So this will work for any function with A, B and C there. 
And so in general, to get the vertex, the axis of symmetry will be whatever's in front of X and X B over two times that value. I wouldn't use this to find the Y. I get this as a number, sub it in, sub the B and A value in, then sub it into F of X and get the Y value that way, rather than trying to remember this very complicated looking expression here, C take B squared on A. Okay, they've used it down here, but I would stick this neg 3 back in here and find the function value when X equals neg 3. Alright, so that's a good process, so please remember now, the vertex can be given by neg B over 2A, comma, f of neg b over 2a where of course x equals neg b over 2a is the axis of symmetry all doable now without completion of the square just using the formula because deductive reasoning up here we've actually been able to prove it all right let's come down and look at the next challenge we've found the vertex but we want to find the zero of a quadratic function. The zero of a function is where it cuts the x-axis, where the function value is zero. So if this is the graph of y equals fx, now we know y is increasing up here, y is zero along the x-axis because you haven't gone up or down. So that's where the name, the zeros of the function come in. Okay, they are the x values at which the function value is zero, at which y equals zero, crossing the x-axis. So um, we want to find where the function is naught. Technically it's not roots. The roots are the solutions to an equation. Solutions to the equation, not really properties of a function. The zeros are the property of the function, just technically solutions to the equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals naught are the roots. The roots belong to an equation, zeros belong to a function. So uh, should keep that in mind. Okay, so here we are. Um, if we're finding the zeros where it cuts the x-axis, then we're putting the function equal to naught. Okay, there are five methods that uh, Pearsons are mentioning here. Let's go down and find these properties of that function. So here, uh, some square root examples, simple function, put equal to naught, there'd be two solutions. Factorising, so here if we get it in that form, then you can put by the null factor law, either the first term equal naught, or the second term. Or a common factor, put the first term equal naught, or the second. You can complete the square, because if you complete the square and put it equal to naught, then we can get roots in this form. So you can solve ax squared plus bx plus c equals naught using the perfect square form. A bit harder, we're going through all this trouble to do that. That's not too bad. And then there's a quadratic formula. So you could do this and then just put the numbers in the formula to find the solutions. Do you know how that works? Let's just have a look. If you have this equal naught and complete the square, you get AX take B on 2A squared plus C take, what was it? Do you remember? Here, I'll take you back up again. If we go up again here, do you remember that, here we are, here it is, C take B squared on 4A. So taking that from there, from our perfect square, C take B squared on 4A equals naught, and we can rearrange this to get our quadratic formula. This all squared equals b squared take 4ac, getting it all over 4a, 
and then if we take the square root there it's plus or minus square root of b squared take 4ac over 4a then if we add b over 2a can you see that that's going to give us this thing here so that deductive work back there for the vertex can be used to generate the general quadratic formula for solving where the general function equals naught or cuts the x-axis. Okay, you can do it with graphing on the calculator because I've used Casio here. So let's go to graph mode, put in the function, draw the graph, and then you want to find something about the function, so you go to Shift F5 to get that yellow second function key, G solve, and up comes this window. And uh, then you can go to the next page if you want and get these things, solutions to the graph. G solve means you're solving a graph. If you want to find where it cuts the x axis, Unfortunately, Casio used root. Now, if you're solving a graph, a graph does not have a root. It has a zero. So really speaking, that should be the zero of a function or the roots of its equation. But to find where it cuts the x-axis, the zeros, we actually have to hit F1, the root there. And then if you toggle across, you will also pick up this value. The first one is neg 1 and y is naught. Then we have a key there, if you remember, on the Casio. And if you toggle across with this key, you'll actually get the second value, which is 3.5. OK, so there are all the ways of solving. There they all are. Different ways of finding the zeros of a quadratic function. So you might rewind that and check it out. But we're going to come down and study the quadratic formula a little bit down here and uh, see what we can make of that. So the quadratic formula, of course, we just derived that, and uh, that's this formula here, neg b plus or minus the square root of b squared take 4ac over 2a. And you can see that there's an interesting part of this function where we take the square root of b squared take 4ac that means if you're going to find the square root of that, then we've got to say that b squared take 4ac must be positive or zero because you can't in here find the square root of a negative number. So this discriminant, as we call it, b squared take 4ac, and we let that be equivalent in sign to the Greek capital delta, for D, for discriminating between the situations where you can work out the roots of this quadratic equation. So uh, we say this discriminates between the situations and tells us what the solutions to the equation are likely to be like. So let's have a look at doing that. So here's it summarised. If we have this function, then if B squared take 4AC, the discriminant, is positive, you will have two roots of that equation. Okay, b squared take 4ac, if this is a positive, you'll have two answers, a positive value and a negative value. So that's why we've got positive and negative there. We'll have two values coming out of that square root. If b squared take 4ac is zero, when you find the square root of zero, it will equal zero. So this will be two real roots. This will be one repeated root. And the last one, when it's negative, there will be no real roots. Square root of a negative is undefined in the real number set. And so there will be no x-intercepts there. So the first one is going to intersect it twice because it's two real roots. The second one is going to only have one solution um, and it's only going to touch the graph and the other one's going to have no x-intercepts. So how does that look? We've got this formula now. Just make sure, you may not have seen this before, to find the solutions to 
a quadratic equation, we can just stick the coefficients of the original function in there, the A value, the B value and the C value. That may need some practice, that one there. Let's come down, have a look at the examples here. So here, use the discriminant to determine how many real solutions each equation has. Visually confirm the result by graphing. OK, let's have a look at this one. B squared take 4AC, there's B squared down here. Hang on. Let's get rid of that. B squared is that. And then uh, take 4 by A is 1 because the number in front of X squared is 1. And then C is this one here. So it's 13, which is positive. Therefore, it should have two distinct real zeros. But remember now, because what we're saying is it's plus or minus the root of something in here which is positive. So it's neg B plus that value over neg B take that value. So if that's positive, you should have two answers, two answers in there. And that should give you a graph like this, which is two intersects, intersection points on the x-axis. What about the second one? Hang on, we really need to have that there. 4x squared, take 12x plus 9. b squared is neg 12 squared. Take 4 by a by c. So that comes to naught. Therefore, we only have one real zero. So therefore, it's going to just touch. That's going to be the vertex. What about the last one? A is 2, B is neg 5, C is 6. B squared, take 4, by A, by C, is negative. It's less than naught. You're not going to get a touching or an intersection at all. You're going to be zero intersections. There's going to be no intersections on the x-axis at all. So, what about this type of problem? Determine the value of k so that the equation has one real zero, two distinct real zeros, or no real zeros. So a is 4, b is, if you like, 4k, and c is 9. So for one real zero, b squared, take 4, by a, by c, must be naught. So we get this. Rearranging it, 16k squared is 144. Dividing by 16, k squared would be 9, so k is plus or minus 3. So what that means in an original function, if you put in 3x, or 4 times 3x, or 4 times neg 3x, you'd have one real zero. What about two distinct real zeros? So b squared, take 4 by a by c, same again, must be greater than 0. So that must, k16, k squared must be greater than 144. Well, k squared is greater than 9. So think about a square being greater than 9. It's got to be outside there or outside there, doesn't it? So it's greater than 3 or less than next 3. No real zeros? Well, the whole thing has to be negative. As remember the formula to find where a graph cuts the x-axis we can use this and if this all falls through if that's a negative if it's a negative there's no real roots to the equation so let's do it so put it less than naught so 16 k squared would be less than 144 moving the term across that side k squared would be less than 9 so now it must be between neg 3 and 3 to have a square less than 9. So there it is there. Interesting, constructing a quadratic um, according to whether you want 2, 1 or no real zeros or intercepts on the axis. So come down, let's have a look at another form of the quadratic function you've called factorise you've done this before and what that means is that if you have it in that factored form you can actually if you change it to that form you can easily see the factored or factorised form you can easily see where it cuts the x-axis because let's do it if you actually put this function equal to naught 
by the null factor law a product is zero when either the first factor is zero or the second factor so x is p or x is q so the two intercepts there are easy to find q naught and p naught so if you are able to factorize it rather than use that formula for the um, zeros then this is an easier way of finding it and of course because of symmetry do you realize the vertex value is always halfway between the zeros halfway between the zeros of the function so the vertex is that and then as I've suggested to you sub this back into f to find the y value hopefully you've done a lot of this in previous study so here we have the summary the vertex is halfway between the zeros p naught and q naught and to get the y value you sub your x value of that vertex into the function let's have a look so here we are um, for the equation of each find the equation of each in this form and also in that form okay so let's look at the first one here since the intercepts are neg 3 and 1 the factors are x plus 3 x take 1 reversing the sign because when you have the null factor law you'll put each of those factors equal to naught and produce those original values neg 3 and 1 you've got to remember there could be various steepnesses through here so it could be much flatter or much steeper okay so you can draw lots of functions so you always have to generalize it with that a so you put that in there and then you can say right let's substitute in when x is naught we know y is six so when x is naught in here y has to come to six when we put it in six times all of that must give a uh, six must equal a times all of that so now over on the left right it's neg 3a has to equal six so a would be neg two okay so it would be a concave parabola or concave down if you want and now if you expanded this using foil and then multiply by two you'd have that other form all right so it's reversing the process let's have a look at this other function here it's just touching so if it's touching it's got a repeated root so it'll be x take 2 by x take 2 remember to get plus 2 must have come from an x take 2 factor being put equal to naught reversing that coming from the null factor law don't forget to generalize it with an a in front and then you've got this thing here and we know the y-intercept is 12 let's go up and have a look at the graph here the y-intercept is 12 so when we put x is naught in the function here we have it here you should get 12 so you would have 4a in there and that means 4a would be 12 a would be 3 so the actual function then would be 3 times x take 2 squared and you could use perfect square expansion there for that bracket or foil multiply it by three and check that answer okay you might have to go back and have a look at what we're doing there see what you think let's do another example the graph of quadratic function intersects the x-axis neg six naught neg two naught and passes through 216 write the function in that form yep good so intercepts neg 2 and 6 will be plus 6 and plus 2 opposite sign for when you're solving with an old factor law don't forget to generalize it so now it goes through 216 <coughs> sub in 2 and you get 16 so everywhere you see x got to put 2 so what that means is 32a would equal 16 a would be a half so the function would be a half outside of x plus 6 x plus 2 now it says also find the vertex 
Now there's a couple of ways of doing that. The vertex value is neg b over 2a. But hang on, I think it's easier to do the average of the x-intercepts here because the x-intercepts were neg 6 and neg 2. So the vertex will be halfway between them. Add them up and divide by 2. The mean is always halfway between the values. So x is neg 4. What's the y value? Sub neg 4 back in your function. Here's your function here. Sub it in there and you find the vertex y value is neg 2. So your vertex is neg 4, neg 2. So if you wanted it in vertex form, you would put in a x take h squared plus k. Well, h is neg 4, so that becomes neg neg 4 plus 4. And k is neg 2, so that goes down on the end. And the a we found before was a half. So you should be able to move between these forms using um, whichever one suits you for what you're about. All right, so here's some um, exercises and uh, they are suggesting here that you use your graphics display calculator. So, uh, and then various means for solving the equations. Um, I'd like you to um, check using the quadratic formula up here, use both and see what you get. So we have to work on this quadratic formula. That might be a little bit new. The formula for finding where a quadratic function is zero. Using that, so I have to practice that. So I'd like you to use that throughout with technology. Just remembering that in paper one we won't have technology though. So have a go. Here are the questions initially down to 17. So pause that, see what you think. Then we'll go on and through to 25 and see what you think. Okay. All right, so pause that, have a go, and right at the end here I'll just display these. Uh, so question one through to two. You can pause it there and then we'll go, and I'll just come down here and do the next little batch from three and four there, a little bit of five and pause that and check the working and then we need to come down to around the ten there and pause that, check your work and then we'll go down the last few here eleven to nineteen just have a look at what they've done there. Bit cramped up. And then 20 to the end, I think we can possibly get in. Not quite. So have a look there. And then 23. Just try to get to 23 there. A few problems there. And then down turning on we've gone back now so we just go down to 31 so I think we'll fit that in there 31 and see what you think all right so you can go for it I'll take it back and leave it where the problems were just back up here so you can make a start there on 2.5 and see what you think. This could be the new thing you might have to spend some time on. Okay, well work hard, you're coming along well. A bit of revision here, um, take a bit of time to remember, do lots of practice, enjoy yourself and we've got one more presentation in this topic, uh, functions and equations, that's on uh, ra rational functions, so I think you'll enjoy that. Check it out with your calculator as you go through all of these and make sure you see what's happening. All right, at the moment, it's cheers from me. Catch you in the next presentation.